But I appreciate y'all coming this morning. It's good to see everybody. Uh, guys talked about cotton variety selection and variety performance. You know, we've got a lot of data out there. Another big part of what Guy and I have been trying to do over the past few years is look at how do we manage particular varieties so that they can perform to their best ability. You know, we talk about matching a variety to an environment. Well, what environment do we put that a particular variety in so it can do the best it can? Um, and, and I'm really going to go over most of, mostly some of the PGR work we've done. I feel like we've, we've made some good strides on that and, and kind of touch a little bit on the irrigation research we're doing. Um, we'll say in, the, in, in one of the other rooms they're talking about irrigation work too, so we'll kind of just talk about it briefly. So with respect to PGRs, um, a lot of this work started back from the 555 era towards now. You know, we lost 555 and I think we all had a, a fair idea on how to manage 555 with plant growth regulators. Um, most of the time it was a prophylactic type application spraying at a certain timing knowing that we had to make those applications to control growth and, and, and manage that crop. Um, having said that, most if not all the new varieties seem to have a, a, a lower requirement for PGRs or are somewhat different in how they respond to PGRs. Without going into a bunch of detail, we've done a lot of work trying to look at, well, what do we need to do to manage growth properly and, and what do we need to do, that, what, what do we see that can be good or bad when we change the PGR recommendations or applications. Um, and the big thing we've seen is that with a lot of these new varieties, it's not just a situation where we know we need to go and spray. Sometimes we may not need to make a, a mepoquad or a PGR application. And a lot of it goes, uh, comes down to the standpoint of we feel like if we overdo it with PGRs now, on some of these new varieties, we can limit yield. Uh, and this was some PGR work. I think this is a picture guy had from a PGR trial. And you can see the impact we have from PGR regimes on some of these new cotton varieties. Some are extremely sensitive and some are not. So uh, back in 2010, we kind of thought about it, well, what do we need to do with all these new varieties we have? And what can we do as far as PGR work with the varieties? And what we wanted to do was at least kind of say, well, let's see if we can group these varieties and how they respond or come up with some kind of classification system so that we can kind of stay on top of new varieties as they come out. Um, we know we're going to see new ones from year to year uh, and, and being able to manage those varieties and have some idea on how to manage them without seeing them in your field can be helpful. So we started this work in 2010 and we've done it for three years now. We've had seven trials and basically what we did in this, in this experiment is we grew varieties in two situations. One, we grew them without any PGRs at all. And then we also grew those varieties when we managed them pretty heavily with picks. Um, and what I mean by that is almost a 555 type uh, PGR regime starting before bloom and making at least three applications of a decent rate. So what that does is gives us the ability to look at you know, growth potential and then also see how they respond uh, to those regimes. We looked at a lot of different things and, and, and we looked at several different varieties. Uh, from 2010 and 11, we had five similar, uh, five locations where we had nine varieties that were similar. And so we looked at data over those nine varieties in those five locations. Uh, this was just average plant height. And you can see that there's a couple things going on. You got the blue bar as no picks and the red bar as the heavier regime. And in all the cases, we see that we reduced plant height when we made that heavier PGR application. Um, Another thing we notice is that there's some difference in how tall these varieties are. If you look at 1740 here on the, on the right side, you know, when it was treated with the heavy PGR regime, we're talking about 35 inches versus 50 inches with the 0949 with no PGRs. So there is some difference in, you know, the, the, the growth potential and the growth response we see when we uh, look at these varieties. Another thing we saw and nothing new is that we see that a lot of times PGRs speed maturity. Uh, in this case, we measured nodes above white flower, which is kind of an indicator of maturity. And in all cases, we lowered the nodes above white flower when we applied uh, PGRs. And that difference, there was a difference that, that varied between varieties. Uh, some we had greater reductions than we had in others. So basically what was happening here is some varieties, we sped maturity much faster than others. And that response was the difference between those. Everybody wonders about lint yield. 
Uh, over those five locations in those nine varieties, we saw where different varieties had different yields. Um, all in all, we didn't see a, a big impact on yield from the PGR application. Um, we'll talk about it in a second from 2012 data, but generally we see that PGRs can sometimes help yield, sometimes they don't affect it, and sometimes they can hurt yield. So, to get down to what we were trying to do as far as classifying varieties and get you guys something easy to use to, to, to make PGR decisions with, we basically took plant height uh, and we averaged it over the PGR regime. So you got the untreated height aver averaged together with the treated height. And by doing that, I think you get a, you, you basically see how these varieties do, and it's kind of a, you get it from two sides. You see the potential, and then you also see the response. Um, and these are those nine varieties, and you can see the plant height. And so from those nine, we sorted them from highest height to lowest height, and they kind of appeared to be four different groups. Um, you can see there's three here that are, that are kind of towards the top, one that seems to be different from that group and that group, and then these two at the bottom. So that's kind of where we started. So based on the, what we knew about PGRs and, and kind of what we've seen with other experiments, we said, well, let's classify these, these varieties in those four groups. Let's just make four arbitrary groups uh, with varieties needing the most PGR management down to ones that may not need any at all. And again, we're basing this on plant height as, or I guess kind of potential or response we see to PGRs. So this is kind of the basis of that handout you'll see that me and Guy hand out or, or talk about in our county meetings. Uh, and basically, like I said, you've got four arbitrary groups from varieties we feel like need the most management down to ones that may not need any at all. Uh, and basically we've got here, we sorted these varieties and then we've also got some, some, some general recommendations on PGR uh, ideas. We want to be general from the standpoint of we know PGR decisions are, are impacted a lot more by other things like environment or irrigation or fertility uh, rather than variety. So we've got some, some pretty bland uh, uh, or general recommendations here. So in 2011, uh, we had, I need to change that, in 2011 we had two locations that we added uh, and we had quite a few more varieties in that study in 2011. So what we did is we looked at each one of these varieties, and again, this is plant height, averaged over PGR regime, and we compared the varieties that we didn't have in the first group, the, the, the new ones, to the ones that we had an idea where they were in those four classifications. So basically we said, well, you know, we, hadn't, we didn't have 499 in that group. Where does it fit compared to these other varieties, and what group does it go in? Um, and from that, we added several varieties in 11. So basically what we're doing is we're saying that, you know, 499 and 1137, we added them to this, these three delta pine varieties. Basically what we're saying is we've seen similar growth potential and response among those varieties. Uh, and we've added several in these other categories here. 2012, we looked at three more new ones. Uh, and you can see the average plant height. Uh, there from Tifton and Midville average over those locations and we've added a couple more. So this is kind of just shows you how we've come up with this kind of slide or general PGR recommendation by varieties. And what I mean by that is that in general varieties didn't respond differently to the PGR gene. You know, and it kind of goes against what we're saying about how varieties respond differently but knowing the impacts other factors have on PGR recommendations and, and, and cotton growth, we, we kind of would expect that uh, since they were all in the same environment. <laughs> so uh, we saw two different things in Tifton and Midville, so we broke up the location. If you look at plant height, and here we've got all the data averaged across varieties. Uh, in both Tifton and in Midville, we reduced plant height when we put on picks not earth shatter. Uh, and if we look at total main stem nodes, or the, basically the number of nodes we had on that plant, in both locations, we reduced the number of main stem nodes uh, by having the PGR regime. If you look at lint yield, two different things happened. In Midville, uh, when we had no picks, average over all the varieties, we actually increased lint yield by using a heavy PGR regime. In Tifton, 
we, we pretty much hurt lint yields by fixing it pretty heavy. So we saw two different things go on there. If you look at Tifton's data, where we hurt yields by picks and cotton, you can see a couple things go on. Uh, and this is kind of basically some things about bowl production. You look at number of bowls per plant. If you look at total number of bowls per plant in Tifton, by using a heavy PGR regime, we lowered the t number of bowls per plant. Um, we lowered the number of bowls per plant on the first position, and we lowered the number of bowls per plant on the second position. So we basically uh, made fewer bowls per plant when we picked it uh, compared to not. If you look within that first position, so we, you know, what we're doing here is you're basically looking at where those bowls are on the plant. So four through eight being at the bottom of the plant, that's node, main node four through eight, node nine through 12, moving up the plant. In Tifton, again, when we hurt yields, we had fewer bowls uh, when we picked it heavily in the upper nodes in the plant. The same thing in the second position. So what we think happened here is when we picked the cotton with a heavy PGR regime, we basically squatted the plant down, lowered the number of fruiting sites, and we couldn't produce as many bowls and therefore we hurt yield. And that's what we can see sometimes from, from PG, overdoing PGRs. If you look at Midville where we increase yield, we kind of saw something different. If you look at the number of bowls per plant when we didn't pick it when we did, relatively same number. Um, we did see a, a, a higher number of bowls on the first position uh, when we didn't pick the cotton. And we also made a few more bowls per plant or about one more bowl per plant on the vegetative branches. So we kind of changed where the bowls were on the plant, but we didn't change the total number that were out there. Again, looking at where those bowls are from the top to the bottom, you can see some differences here. Uh, and where we, the big thing we saw is that we basically shifted bowl production down towards the bottom of the plant when we used those heavy PGR regimes. So you had more bowls per plant in the lower nodes when we picked the cotton and more bowls per plant in the higher nodes when we didn't uh, use picks. Same thing on the second position. We basically shifted bowl production. So again, when we talk about the fact that PGRs don't necessarily make you more yield or make less yield, but they can change it, a lot of times the differences we see in yield from PGR regimes is where the cotton is put on the plant. So in Tifton, again, we just reduced the number of sites, reduced the plant, uh, the, the basically the number of, of places we could put a bowl and ultimately bowl number per plant, and we lost yield that way. Uh, and in Midville, I basically squatted the plant down, but I, what I did is actually uh, put more energy to bowl production lower in the plant canopy when I applied that heavy PGR regime. Um, in Midville, I compensated with, with bowls up top, so we made the same number of bowls, but these bowls were ultimately bigger and had more time to mature, and we had higher yields when we used those PGR regimes. So that's kind of some of the stuff we've seen. Any thoughts or comments on what we've got here? We've done a lot of work with PGRs, and I, I, I ran through it pretty quick, but I think we're pretty confident in a lot of stuff we, we've seen with PGRs. Uh, and again, it varies from place to place. I'll touch on irrigation real quick. Uh, if we got time. Guy and I have also been working with some cotton irrigation scheduling stuff. Um, and we've done it for a couple reasons. One is I think there's no doubt we've put in a lot more irrigation systems in Georgia. Um, another is the fact that you know, water is an important factor in, in cotton production. Um, and one more thing is the fact that we have new varieties that we see all these different responses with these different varieties. Does ir irrigation have an impact on how a variety does as far as uh, increasing yield? One of the main things we started to do was we wanted to say, well, you know, how do we irrigate cotton in Georgia? So how, you know, what, what's, the, what's the easiest way to do it? And there's a lot of different ways to schedule irrigations, but it, we found this in the cotton production guide, and you guys have this in the cotton production guide. It's basically a, a water requirement per week. Uh, and it says in here that if cotton gets this much water per week, depending on growth stage or week of bloom, we can maximize yields. 
And this was an older piece of information. Uh, probably much been here a lot longer than me and Guy have. So we took this checkbook and we basically watered cotton so that we ensured we got so much water per week depending on uh, the growth stage of the cotton. And the thing you'll notice is that basically with water use or water requirements, we're saying about an inch per week up until bloom and then that requirement peaks during peak bloom up towards two inches and falls off. Um, so we kind of wanted to compare irrigation scheduling just basically kind of using a checkbook ensuring we get that amount of water per week. We also looked at scheduling irrigation with soil moisture sensors and I think John and those guys are talking about it over there. There's a lot of work done with, been done with soil moisture sensors. I know some of you probably use them and some of you may have consultants that, that utilize them to help you schedule irrigation. The big thing we saw with soil moisture sensors uh, was that and the big thing we think we can see with soil moisture sensors is the fact that you know we're going to get a lot of rainfall in Georgia. How do we know when to start back irrigating or decide that we could wait a little bit long? Um, if we get two inches of rain, how long does it last? Is it going to last two weeks or one week? Um, knowing the fact that based on work done here that if cotton, the cotton crop wilts, you lose yield potential, how do you know when to come back? Uh, and by using some of these sensors, you can make a decision uh, more properly to come back in and hopefully not lose any yield. The work we've done, we started this in 2011 and we've done it in 12. Uh, this is kind of some, this is some of that work done in Camilla and Midville from Guy and I uh, and Cal, if he's in here, uh, our graduate student, Cal Meeks. Uh, what we've seen is that using that checkbook or using the soil moisture sensors we can increase yields with irrigation. Uh, nothing new. Uh, we also saw that the checkbook methods are by giving cotton that amount of water per week, we did pretty good as far as cotton yields. I think we did almost as good as if we used soil moisture sensors. Um, and that was in 2011. Another thing we saw with pertaining to varieties uh, is that we saw where the two varieties we utilized, they responded differently to irrigation levels. Um, specifically the fact that we had one variety that maxed out yields at a lower level of irrigation compared to another. Um, and in this case, Delta Pine 1050, we maximized yields when we put on a lower amount of water. Um, so if we increased our, our, our irrigation scheduling or ir increased our irrigation applications, we didn't continue to increase yield. Um, and with 1740 in this case, the more water we put, we made stepwise increases in yield. So what does that mean for us in varieties? Uh, I think it may mean that we'll have varieties that we can hopefully say, well, these varieties are going to be more stable in their yield. And in some of our larger pivots where we may not be able to get a lot of water per week out or have some limitations in the amount of water we have to, to use the whole year, we'll see these varieties are more stable. Uh, and we'll have varieties that are maybe ones we can gear higher towards higher yields knowing we can put enough water out per week. Uh, we did this stuff in 2012 and, and Guy and I did a lot of irrigation research in 2012. Um, you guys made record yields in 2012 and I'd like to think that a fraction of, of the reason for that is the fact that me and Guy did so much irrigation research. Uh, if, if you do the irrigation research it'll rain. So we'll do it next year and hopefully we get the same results. Uh, won't go into 2012, but in Midville for my stuff, it started raining at first bloom and I didn't need any irrigation throughout the year and irrigation didn't improve yield. Uh, in Camilla, there was some, some, some similar stuff seen. Uh, but one thing I did notice from 2012 is the fact that, you know, using this checkbook, even with all the rainfall I had, I still needed to put water out on the crop. And when I had those soil moisture sensors, I said, well, my soil is saturated. There's no reason for me to go in there and continue to put water. Um, so we see the benefits of scheduling irrigation from using both of those tools. Uh, that kind of sums that up. Uh, so that's all I got. I appreciate y'all's time. It's good to see everybody. Anybody got any questions? <coughs>